Big up Crosses TV. Crosses TV in another building. To the extent it was relevant, what had happened by their council. The gap between 2.50 p.m. and 3.16 p.m. The second point is anyway, their council um, just simply didn't object to the uh, course taken by the judge of holding this in private. Nor did, nor did they object to the, um, the course, the more general course the judge took of removing the juror. Um, that's a point made by the Court of Appeal, and in my submission, that's a good point. And there's no reason to interfere with the Court of Appeal's judgment on this issue, um, uh, which, uh, which, which um, is referred to in our respective cases. Can I just also draw your attention now to the case of Bonnet, where a not entirely dissimilar thing appears to have happened, um, and it's in the electronic bundle at page 6287. Um, and that's where the case is. Forgive me, my lord, I think I've got, I picked up the wrong bundle. It's 6287. The relevant paragraph, if I can ask you to look at it, it's 6289, paragraph 21. And if I can just ask you to read that to yourselves. Just paragraph 21. Sorry, paragraph 21 and paragraph 22. And then 23. There's 21 to 23. In particular, 22 to 23 where a similar sort of argument was run in a slightly similar circumstances. <coughs> 23 in particular. And the reason I draw attention to that is there are two things. First of all, it's up to the judge. When you get these unusual spin balls the public way, it's up to the judge in the immediate circumstances to, to work out what is the best way of dealing with it. Uh, and uh, I do submit hindsight and perfection are rather dangerous uh, uh, guides when that's the question. And that's the Orgel's case. The second thing is, is the uh, uh, Lord Hope emphasized as well, in that case, the, uh, the, the appellant had three previous convictions, and the idea was that the juror, knowing the appellant, might then have gone and told all the other members of the jury, which Lord Hope says, but there was simply no evidence of that. So we, we're not going to interfere on that ground. And I submit, well, it's not identical, but it's a similar type of situation. So I submit, for that reason too, 
there's no reason uh, to uh, uh, interfere with the Court of Appeals view of that jury incident. If I can go now to the third um, point, can I just mention this? The judge, pers just basic facts, the judge persistently gave jurors very strong warnings right at the beginning of the case, and we set them out in our uh, the, the main ones, right at the beginning of the case, he emphasizes to the jurors in terms that they are the judges, that's a phrase he keeps on using, you are the judges, and you must decide in accordance with your oath. Um, and I think if I can just go to the key bundle of documents, uh, and it's our, we, we, sum it, we set it out, the relevant bits in our written case. Um, at page 6236. I'll give the references, but you can see paragraph 66, and then, um, I'm ashamed to say 65, follows after 66. Um, those are the things he says right at the beginning. And 67. Now, so very clear direction right at the beginning. Decide in accordance with your oath. Don't speak to anyone whatsoever. And that's you see in the two references I give there. And then in paragraph 67, we give various other references. Every time he sends the jury out, he reminds them in terms, do not talk to anyone. You have a very serious function to perform. Don't go and mess everything up now because it'll be fatal to this case if you talk to people. This is the drift, and I, I have millions more references, which I don't have to hand, but all the time he's saying to the jury, take, this is a very serious thing. You mustn't speak to anyone. You must remember your oath. And my lords, I say this is important, and my lords, my lady, I say this is important because after 56 days, the jury would have been well aware of the seriousness of their task, and that they must not talk to anyone, and they must decide in accordance with the evidence. But that's talking to somebody outside their number. What we're concerned with here is somebody within the... Ah, I will come to what you might call the naughty juror in a moment. But oh, the, uh, okay. I mean, obviously, it might be said he doesn't seem to have taken very much notice of it. I agree. I'll, I will do that. that. Too, but... uh, yeah. <laughs> there is that point. Um, but... Well, I'm talking for the moment about the, uh, I'm going to address the points of law, obviously. Um, but the, as a matter of fact, the jury had well impressed, and certainly the 10, if I can put it that way, the 10 had well impressed in their minds the importance of deciding in accordance with the evidence. Of that, there can be no doubt. And throughout the trial, they are obviously very well aware of the enormous publicity this case is creating. They know they are doing a very serious job. It's not just a one, two, three-day job, small case. This is the, the big case in Jamaica. Uh, it's on the news every night. <clears throat> crowds outside the courtroom. Crowds in the courtroom. This is, they are, they realize, so to speak, they are separate from the public. And that, in my submission, is an important point for the, when bearing in mind whether the judge was entitled to trust the jury. I'll, I'll deal with about the miscreant. And in my submission, he was. He's given these directions. And they have, apart, of course, from the misprint juror, they, there's no reason to doubt that the ten have acted properly. My lord, my lady, the next point I want to emphasize, and I'll come to, if I may, uh, the transcript, but the bribe was offered by the misprint juror on behalf of, or rather in the interest of, all five defendants, including Shane Williams. Now, you can see why I emphasize that, because the jury obviously did not convict Shane Williams. Well, the 10 didn't. He was acquitted. And I'm going to come in a moment to the um, transcript, if I may. But while I'm on that point, the Shane Williams point, uh, 
Chow gave evidence of a fight or the attack in which the four men apart from Shane Williams were involved. In other words, Shane Williams was not himself implicated by Chow in the actual killing. What he was implicated in was that it was said Chow gave evidence that um, Shane Williams, who he called Terence, was one of the men in the video talking about a killing. And that was the basis on which the case went to the jury. So there was evidence, the judge did allow evidence to go to the jury in relation to Shane Williams, but it wasn't what you might call the same evidence Chow gave against the other four men. Uh, if, I, uh, if I can just give you the reference for uh, Shane Williams' involvement, or rather Charles' evidence of Shane Williams' involvement, it's at E4011. And uh, he's, Shane Williams is one of the people identified in the video, which was said to be incriminating. That was the case against him. But I do submit it is important that that is an indication the jury were not just saying to themselves, I see, a bribe has been offered on behalf of all of them, so they must all be guilty. The jury has distinguished between them. Are you going, going to take us to the references to the five, to the, the bribe being offered on behalf of all five? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Because um, I, would, I would like to, to go to, it's not a very long transcript, I would quite like to go to the transcript to see what actually happened in front of the judge. I'd like, if I may, to go to the facts first, and then I will deal with the issues of law which arise as a result of them. <clears throat> um, the transcript is at 5-1, begins the relevant part, I think, is at 5167. <clears throat> I should, have, I should say, actually, 5164 is where the <coughs> uh, chamber's meeting begins, 2.20 p.m. on the last day of the trial, or rather, uh, last day of the um, summing up. 2.20 p.m., court resumes, and the judge then reports that he's heard that a, uh, an offer, uh, a member of the jury has been offering a $500,000 bribe to do a particular thing. You see that about a third halfway down. Um, my lords, my lady, just for information, the exchange rate at that point was in pounds, 180 um, Jamaican dollars to one pound. So we're talking here about, I think, something in the region of 2,700 pounds. That's the total number. So I'm on the wrong page. Which, one, which page are you on? 5164. Forgive me, my lord, I did say 5167, then I, I went back to 5164. Well, I'm now back. Thank you. Um, so that's the, that, that's, the, that's the size of the bribe, if I can put it that way. I'm not saying that makes it any better, but <laughs> obviously not. But on the other hand, it's not such a gigantic sum as to lead to the conclusion something uh, that, well, there can only be an incredibly rich person who's offering it. Um, uh, that's, so the judge says, well, I've heard, I've heard about this bribe, apparently. Um, and he explains how he's come to hear it. And then... At 5167, or 5166, you'll see that the DPP has been called in, about a third of the way down the page. Now, she didn't present the case for the prosecution, but I'm told by her, she's in court at the moment, Miss Paola Llewellyn, uh, that when this incident arose, uh, the judge uh, called for her, if she was available to come along, as did indeed the deputy DPP, uh, and so she turned up, because obviously this was um, a difficult incident uh, to know what to deal with. So you see there, 5166, she's come along. Uh, and then at the, uh, she will see what she suggests at the bottom of the page, 5166. Judge, it's dependent on what your lordship decides. Clearly that's the issue. We'll have to go to another domain. That's Uh, between her as the complainant, a particular person, if there's to be credibility in the matter, that's uh, not for you. It's a very serious matter. So she's not encouraging the judge to say it's 
speak to make any further investigations into this. I submit quite rightly. Um, judge, uh, if that report is credible, and having heard the thing, one decision will have to be made in respect of that man today. He's going to make up his mind now. Um, uh, and DPP says yes. And then uh, the judge says, this is all very painful, uh, but I'm going to have to arrange for Madam Foreman to come into the uh, uh, into chambers. You see that about two thirds of the way down the page. And then the four, Madam do Foreman. We, do we assume that during that period of time, who else has been? Is there any indication who else is with the judge and the DPP? Um, I think all all council. I should say, as I. I understand that all council are present, but not the appellants themselves. I don't think there's any issue on that. Right. Thank you. Doesn't actually tell us, does it? You're right, my lord, but I have a feeling uh, I don't think it's in contention. Thank you. And before he says that he's going to call Madam Foreman, he says that he's going to summon that juror and he's had instructions to the police. Yes. In fact, he never does. Yes. But he does get the form foreman, Madam Foreman along. And so she turns up, um, I'm now at 5167 at 2.43 p.m. Um, judge, you can see what the judge says, 5167, line 19. Um, and if you can, maybe simpler, but my lords, my lady, if you read on uh, to 5173, rather than me picking out bits here and there, because there may be other things which um, I... Miss out, which you might want to Sorry, read. To which, to which page? 5173. Thank you. And then I'll make some comments on it.
Um, yes. I will too. Maybe if you're ready. So if I can just draw particular attention to the following points. First, at 5168. My learned friend is quite right. And he says, uh, the contact was made with me today, so she finds out today. However, the contact has been made over a period of time with other jurors, and they confessed it to me. However, I cautioned them and told them that we are going solely on the evidence. I told them not to be swayed, that's the word, not to be swayed with what is being said, and they cannot be intimidated by what's been said either. So they're okay. Uh, and then um, she goes on to say how uh, the bribing juror um, uh, got in touch with her and seemed to be frightened of her at first, or frightened to do so at first. Um, the second point is at 5170, at the top of the page, he called me out. That's a uh, bribing juror. Uh, we were in the room. He said he needed to talk to me in the jury room. I asked him what he wanted to talk to me about. He said to me that he knows that I'm influential and people listen to me. I said, it's not about listening to me. It's based on whether I pointed them to the facts of what we hear, not to be influenced by what is outside. He said to me, well, he needs me to do him a favor. And then dropping down, I asked him, what was that about? He said that we should go to lunch. I said, no, I can't leave because I have things to do and I have somebody coming to me. Basically, he said, I should convince everybody to release and then, in answer to my lady, Lady Simmons, point, the men at the bar, not at the bar. Um, and then over the page, 5171, judge asked you of the, uh, the foreman, the forewoman, you knew him before you came on the panel? No, no. I met him here, but when we met, that's when my suspicion of him grew. We started watching and observing his actions from there, like we, because initially he was mad they chose me as the foreman. He went to Rev. 1 and tried to ask them to make him the foreman instead. And that basically goes on to say, um, that's it's a duty, um, and we don't, being the foreman doesn't mean I'm going to have tea in the judges' chambers, eat crackers and go for lunch, it's a duty. So that's what she's saying. So the, what she's saying, essentially, is, he seems to have gotten to head. He wants to be as well the big, the big chief. Um, he's disgruntled about this, uh, and he, she just took no notice. Um, but importantly, towards the end of five one seven one, but over time he recognised that okay, fine. Before he started going to these persons and telling them that, listen, this is what we need to do. I would say you are listening to the evidence. He said no. We just need to let go de men again. Them. So. Uh, when we speak today, he said to me, that's what we need to do. And he says the con she says the conversation went on for five minutes and she repeats the £500,000 figure. Then towards the end of 5172, uh, he says, as Mr. Southey uh, rightly pointed out, Madam Foreman, 11 of us, he spoke to 11 of us, that would probably suggest, therefore, the, the discharged juror. He spoke to nine persons first. The thing is, nobody's listening to him. Because nobody's listening to him, he wants me to speak to them. I do emphasize that. So I'm not listening to him either. That's the reason why I got him on tape. The trouble was, the tape wasn't particularly uh, clear, so it never got played. And then you'll see that um, Madam Foreman leaves at 2.52 p.m. Now, I emphasize that because she leaves in advance, and the Summing up doesn't resume, I think I'm right in saying, until about 3.20. So there's plenty of time for her to inform, because she's bound to inform the jurors of what has happened, that she's been to see the judge in chambers. Um, and you'll see um, 5173, the, the, the DPP says to the judge, I wonder if you can allow each team to discuss for five minutes. I will wish to speak, and I'm sure my learned friends will wish to speak, perhaps five minutes. So again, the reason I emphasize this is there was time for the appellants to speak to, or rather the appellants' counsel, to speak to um, the appellants themselves. And then the uh, DPP, at, towards the foot of 5173, recommends to the judge, uh, just warn them again about their oath, just their oath. That is what she is suggesting. And then over the page, Mr. Finson, Tavares Finson, um, well, uh, you'll see 5174, the DPP at the top, repeats, as far as the prosecution is concerned, we're prepared for the matter to proceed, just to remind them of their oath. And then Mr. Palmer's counsel, we're at the view, don't see how you can proceed in these circumstances where you've got one person who is making an allegation that someone's going around offering the jurors money. 
she obviously has some tape, her role. So he seems to be objecting, not on the basis that, so to speak, there's a, a, a corrupt jury who is uh, on their side, but rather, uh, she's, uh, he's rather concerned about what the poor woman is saying. Um, but in any event, uh, Miss um, uh, Llewellyn then says, DPP says, in fact, it's the prosecution who is most disadvantaged by carrying on. And in my submission, that's obviously right in principle. There's one person who obviously wants to let these people off. Uh, there is a risk uh, that he is going to be persuading others or has persuaded others. And then you'll see at the end, at 5175, the matter ends at 3.07 p.m. Um, and what happened immediately after that is when the summing up resumes, the first thing the judge does, I think I'm right in saying, is remind the jury, if I can just dig up my reference, I hope this is right, 5149 at 3.22 p.m. Just remind me, M Mr. Rogers was representing who? I think it's St. John. Um, I, I have... Right, so you've got Mr. Finson not exactly agreeing with the... Mr. Finson's for father. Yes, I see. But you've got both Mr. Finson and then Mr. Rogers raising, on the face of it, objections. To Concerns, them. yeah. I, I would have to accept. They're, they're saying we're not very happy about this. And I think one of them says I'm concerned about the overcompensation point. And maybe Mr. Rogers says there may be there's a risk of overcompensation. That is to say, the jurors will swing too far in favour of the prosecution um, because of the their knowledge of the bribery attempt. Can I just mention one point before I go to what the judge does? I should have made it before. It's not clear whether, and there was no investigation whether or not the bribe was coming from the appellants themselves, and that's why I mentioned the figure of £2,700 equivalent. This is, it may just be this particular person was, don't forget we're talking about very famous people, he's a, a particular aficionado, we don't know, of um, uh, Mr. Palmer's and Mr. Campbell's um, work. But in my submission, um, what the judge has done, subject of course to points of law, is in my submission, uh, again, very difficult circumstances, but perfectly sensible. He's called in the relevant parties, and on the face of it, the party most affected by the problem, the prosecution, is saying, I'm prepared to carry on. And the reason, of course, for that is that this is day 56. In practice, it will be, or may well be, a very difficult to get a, 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 a retrial of this matter. Another 56 days, you're going to have to get Mr. Chow to come along again. I would, I would hope that you could take judicial notice of the sheer difficulty, certainly, in relation to some of these witnesses coming along again and arranging things. What happened is going back to page 5149, is the judge reminding the jury at lines 3 to 13 of their duty. He doesn't say there that they shouldn't hold anything against these appellants. No, he doesn't. Um, uh, but, uh, my lady, I would submit it's obviously implicit. I mean, the context here is that the poor woman's been called over to see the judge to talk about the bribery. And he's, she's been told to go back and tell the jurors to deal with the matter in accordance with their oath. And they, of course, will know about this, these allegations of bribery because it's said that the bribery has been offered to all of them. So he, um, he can delegate his duty. Well, I, 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 my lady, my learned friends like that. Uh, but, <laughs> no, I'm not saying he can delegate his duty, but it's quite clear that he's taken a favourable impression of the forewoman, and it's quite a sensible way. He's not delegating, but he's saying to the foreman, you tell them, as you have been already, you decide in accordance with their, uh, your oath, and then he reminds them of exactly the same thing uh, uh, when you get to 5149. I agree he doesn't mention, um, and my, my lady, my lords, I can, one can see why. He doesn't specifically mention, I gather someone has been bribing you. It's, he's in a difficult position, whichever way he goes. And I submit it's a perfectly fair thing to say, I'm reminding you of your oath. It's an oath to decide in accordance with the evidence. Uh, and the juror would, jurors, jurors would have known that was their obligation. Sorry, which page were you on uh, when you're saying that he immediately uh, tells the jury? 5149. 
The summing up resumes at 3.22 p.m. 5149. So the first thing he does is tell the jurors after the break, which everyone knows what it's going to be about, first thing he says, decide in accordance with your oath. Thank you. uh, in my submission, uh, economy sometimes, just making the main point, is the best course. And this, in my submission, is a perfectly reasonable course for the judge to adopt. Because everyone knows what he means by this. Um, can I just also emphasize that subsequently, at 5157, the judge repeats the direction he had already given, but importantly, he repeats at 5157, decide each, the case against each of these defendants separately. That's 5157, lines um, 10 to 18. And he then goes on at 5159. Um, he gives the standard direction about reasonable doubt. At 5159, at the invitation, I think I'm right in saying, of the deputy DPP, who was back in the seat, so to speak, and he gives good character directions at 5159. And I think those good character directions apply to all the defendants, bar one. It may have been Mr. Jones, I'm not quite sure. Now, I mentioned the point about Shane Williams being acquitted. That, in my submission, is not an insignificant point. There are ECH half cases, which I don't have immediately to hand, but I'm sure I can find them in a minute, where problems have arisen, where the jurors have rep uh, reported to the judge that one of their number is making racist comments. And there was one case, I, I will come to it in a moment, where there were two defendants, and they were both Asian. And the report gets back to the judge, I'm very worried about this. Um, this, this, this chap keeps on making racist comments to that effect. Uh, but the jury convict one, but acquit the other. The matter goes, of course, the appeal, who say, well, there's no doubt there were, there was reason to suppose bias. But on the other hand, the judge gave directions to follow your oath. Uh, and the matter went to the ECHR, um, uh, who took the same point. And they said, well, the, the, the judge did what was necessary, he reminded them of their oath. And you can take into account the fact that the jury don't seem to be. Uh, they, 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 uh, they do seem to be able to, to distinguish between the guilty and the innocent. My, my lords, um, my lady, if, if I can perhaps just have a moment, or if I can remind you of what that was in a moment. But, that, uh, but I submit that is important. One cannot simply ignore the fact the jury, on the face of it, have performed their duty. They've put this evidence, they've looked at the evidence, and they've acquitted one person on whose behalf or in whose interest it was said this bribe has been offered. I think the name of the case is Gregory, but I don't have it, I don't have the reference to hand. Um, so that's what I want to say about the facts. Then I come to the issues, if I may. I say there are two issues. The first is, was the judge obliged to discharge the jury? Did he have to? Did he have no real choice as a matter of law? The second issue is, if he was not obliged to do, discharge the jury, was the procedure he followed sufficient to ensure that the defendants, all the defendants, received a fair trial? Now, the first issue in my submission raises in turn two questions. The first is this. Was the judge obliged to discharge the jury on the basis that there was good reason to suppose that one of them was biased in favor of the defendants, or indeed all the defendants, regardless of the prosecution's willingness to continue? In other words, as just as a matter of law, was the position such that, look, you haven't got 11 impartial jurors here. We know you've got one bent one, He's bent in favor of the defense, but you have to discharge. And that's the first question as a matter of law. Mm. Uh, notwithstanding the prosecution's waiver, if I can put it that way, of the point. That's, that's question number one. The question number two is, was the judge obliged to discharge the jury on the basis that realistically uh, the other well, uh, 10 jurors, the non-bribing juror, the other 10 jurors would consciously 
or unconsciously be prejudiced by their knowledge of the offers of bribes, prejudiced against all the defendants, regardless of the directions that he had given or indeed could give to tell them to abide by their oath. Yeah, that, in my submission, is a separate question. Yeah, the, the way it's put in Putnam is a, a real risk that they might have become yes. consciously or unconsciously prejudiced. Real risk they might have become. I, that's why, I, forgive me, my lord, that was I, was I was trying to go by the Putnam test, consciously or unconsciously. Mm. Is that something which is going to be in the back of their minds, come what may? Um, now, on the first question, namely, you've got one rotten apple here, so that's it. We say that can't be right. Uh, and um, we have in our written case drawn attention to the case of Brown, which is in the electronic bundle at 6329, paragraph 31, where a uh, not identical thing happened, but the problem arose, what is a judge to do? <laughs> um, or rather, the, the, the point was made that appellate, the defendants cannot derail trials just by making offers of bribes to juries and so forth. It's not on all fours, but I submit it is important all the same. So it's uh, 6329. And it's paragraph 31. Um, we fully understand any judge's reluctance to discharge a jury in circumstances to which a defendant bore material responsibility. <laughs> Although there are no doubt gradations of responsibility, starting with deliberate misconduct by a defendant aimed at achieving a discharge in circumstances where a child is going badly, or at achieving a favourable verdict and ranging downwards in seriousness from those situations. Counsel for the uh, appellant thus rightly, in our view, accepted before us that it cannot be open to a defendant to obtain the discharge of a jury by deliberately creating some ground of aggravation or discord between him and the jury, whether inside or outside court. But in order for a judge to rely on the appellant's responsibility for events occurring as a ground for not discharging a jury, the circumstances giving rise to such responsibility must, it seems to us, either be agreed or ascertained by the judge to exist. It cannot be assumed since it is a prima facie case. Now, that's not on all fours, but I submit the basic point is this. It's not open to uh, either a defendant himself or, indeed, a juror acting, if you like, without instructions um, from the defendant, but nonetheless in the defendant's interest, to derail a trial. And I submit that's an important point, and I submit it also goes to the whole jury system, and it will bring the jury system into disrepute uh, in a case such as this. If the position is really this, there are 10 <coughs> innocent jurors who have performed their duty, assume for the moment, who have performed their duty without any shred of bias. It would bring the system into disrepute if the verdict is nonetheless to be set aside because of the one bad juror who was not obeying his duty. I submit that it would be, one can understand what you might call the purest version of that. One can understand, of course, the notion that a jury has collective responsibility. But in my submission, that would be a very, would strike, I submit, uh, the, what you might call the man in the street, the sensible man in the street, as a remarkable result. But the normal scenario would be that, of course, you'd get rid of that juror. I agree. Um, the difficulty here... I mean, you wouldn't say, well, you can carry on with that juror. But I think, my lords, I'm, I'm bound to accept that the, we don't know, of course, but obviously what concerned the judge is, I, I don't think I took you specifically to it, but he does at one point say, what am I going to have to, what am I going to do? Either yes. I let the jury, juror out, in which case the case can't continue, or it carries on. I accept what your lordship says, but my lords, again... But what I'm saying is the yeah. quote from paragraph 31 leads yes. us to the obvious um, result, that of course a juror who's refusing to obey directions has to go. He has to go. Well, I that agree. doesn't then follow that, oh, you can leave him on. No. <laughs> Subject to one point, what I call the waiver point. And the prosecution here, it is, as, as they pointed out, they're the losers in this. And they are prepared. I'm, I've, I've well, how can you be sure? We, you just don't know. You don't know. Well, 
well, my, my lady, I, well, funny enough, we do know in one sense because it was a 10 1 verdict, and we know from evidence acquired afterwards that you know who was the one. I don't think there's any doubt about that. <laughs> um, and that, that, well, that was a matter of witness evidence obtained by, funny enough, the defence afterwards. Yes, so, but, it, but if, yeah. if, if it's a. Well, I, I think I, I think the point that her, her ladyship is, is is making is that one one doesn't know how people may react to an attempt to bribe them um, if they thought if the jurors thought that an attempt was being made to bribe them on behalf of the defendants, then that might have been who, who knows it could have inclined them to dig their heels in and prejudice them against the defendants. My, my, my lord, I agree. That, that 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 of course is the second question. I'm just on the first question for the moment. Can I, uh, namely, there was just a rotten juror. Does that of itself mean the verdict cannot stand? And can I give you an example where I submit it is not of itself a sufficient reason? Supposing what happens is this. Um, a jury uh, comes in with, let's say, a 10-1 verdict. The one has been bribed, but the one has not revealed that to anyone else. It all comes out after the trial. Can the defendant come along after and say, <laughs> dear, dear, dear. There was a rotten juror on that. He didn't tell anyone about it. But nonetheless, the verdict must be set aside because there was just one, as well, there was one person who wasn't performing his duty, Quay juror. My submission would be that would receive short shrift from the public court. It would say, well, the rotten juror didn't speak to anyone. He didn't obey his duty. He did uh, come in with a not guilty verdict because he'd been bribed. But on the other hand, that made no difference whatsoever to the 10 who did come in with a guilty verdict. It is, we, we know it didn't, because he didn't even mention it. Now, in those circumstances, I submit the verdict would stand. But I simply give that as an example as to why what you might call the pure point. There have to be 11 good jurors, even when there's a 10-1 verdict and the 10 are good. There have to be 11, and the whole thing falls to pieces. Cannot be right. And I submit that, if that, in the example I've given, that would give rise to very considerable public concern. But the trouble is, we don't know. Oh, I, I bet I'm not supposed to know. <laughs> I know we're not. Who, <laughs> who's saying what in the jury room? So you can never. So the hypothetical you're given can never arise in reality. Well, my lord, I, my lord, I, I hesitate to disagree, but I, I would submit it, it could arise, and indeed, in this case, we do know. Um, precisely what happened. Yeah. I mean, supposing Livingston came for whatever reason, supposing he had not mentioned any of this to the jurors, but afterwards it came out that he had actually received bribes and was convicted. But let's just say, or he had often, he had received bribes from um, yeah. one of the defendants. So it's not on all fours, but I'm simply at the moment on the point, do there have to be 11 good jurors full stop? And if there's one bad juror, the whole thing falls away. I submit that's not right. The, the other question is the different question entirely, <coughs> namely, what about the jury, the ten good jurors, saying to themselves, huh, well, you know, obviously, we all, they're all, they're all, they're all bent, these people, um, and so I'm going to hold, this is a little bit of prejudicial information which they're holding against um, the four appellants. That's the question. Now, my respectful submission on that is, um, the, as well the second part of the question, um, is this. The question is, was the judge bound to assume, in all the circumstances, that whatever directions he had given, or could give, was he bound to assume that the taint, if I can put it that way, of the, the bribing juror was never going to leave the minds of the ten good jurors, such that, maybe even unconsciously, they would hold this against at the accused. But, but isn't that the wrong way around? It, doesn't he have to be sure that there isn't that risk rather than the way you put it? Well, he my has to be sure that there won't be, that there will, that justice will be done yes. rather than the other way around. My lady? I'm trying to say. Yes. I'm bound to accept that. If, and maybe there were too many double negatives in what I was saying. I accept he has to satisfy himself that he is in a position, given what he's already said and will say, to ensure that there will be a fair trial for the other repellents. Yeah. That's the question. And in my submission, it's a question of fact to an extent, but on the facts, I submit he was entitled to come to the conclusion 
that the 10 jurors, with proper directions, uh, would not take into account the fact that one of them had been offering bribes. And that, in my submission, was obviously a matter for the trial judge himself to assess, and that's how he assessed it. And my lords, my lady, I also rely on the fact that the Court of Appeal upheld the judge's judgment on this point. So what you would be effectively doing is saying to the, as were the local courts, they were wrong to hold that justice, there could be a fair trial, not the standing. But the Court of Appeal appears to have been comforted by the fact that there was nothing to be gained by questioning uh, or, or looking or looking into the matter any further. Um, at best, a denial of bribery and a great deal that would have been lost the possibility of having to discharge the whole jury. Was that the right approach? Well, uh, my lady, I think one has to bear in mind what was being put to the Court of Appeal. I think from recollection, what was being said to the Court of Appeal and has not so much been said now, is that the judge should have carried out an inquiry. He should have made more inquiries. Um, my answer to that is uh, that uh, what, uh, uh, the, if the judge was satisfied that a direction would put the matter right, then he was entitled to take that course. I agree. Uh, I agree. The question is, could he rationally be satisfied? You might say, if he couldn't rationally be satisfied, well, that's that. But in my submission, he could be for the reasons I've already, in a sense, gone through right at the beginning. He has reminded the jury of the seriousness of their role and the importance of deciding in accordance with the evidence. He's told them again and again, you are the judges. You are not to speak to anyone. They are well aware of their special position. And I submit it's quite often the case that prejudicial information comes out in the course of the trial, which gets in front of the jury, and as long as a judge's direction, I'll come on to the direction in a moment, as long as a judge's direction is sufficient to ensure that the jury will decide in accordance with the evidence and not in accordance with the unfair prejudicial material, then he's entitled to take that course. And uh, my, lords, uh, my, my lords, my lady, obviously one can well understand, of course, the concern in this case. Of course, that it might be said, well, who could forget? But my lady, my, my lord, I, I submit it's not that difficult. Jurors have to be trusted to act in accordance with their oath. I want to take you to a case about that. It's a fundamental, it's a cardinal principle that jurors do act in accordance with their oath. And they act only in accordance with the evidence. Um, and if I, if I may, can I take you to, again, take you back to the case. of Bonnet, where Lord Hope makes this point, and he refers to um, other uh, cases of higher authority, which say the, fun, the cardinal principle of jury trial is that jurors act in accordance with their oath. They're not Lincoln poops. Can I just ask you, in the context of your submissions, do you see any role for the Porter and McGill test? It's fair to say that where I'm putting it is that the question is whether there was a fair trial or not. Uh, and in my submission, if uh, one could be satisfied that there was a fair trial, that is that. Um, uh, um, I, 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 I mean, in one sense, I accept that what I'm saying is uh, that if the court is satisfied, there was no risk of possible. Well, in one sense, Porter McGill is to do with a, 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 a real risk of possibility uh, that, that the tribunal is is, is biased. It's, but it's not the appearance so much, but there is a risk of possible bias. And to that extent, I accept Porter McGill is right, because in my submission, what the judge did was to remove any risk of possible bias. It's not quite the same way as the Putnam test, but it comes to much the same. But appearance of bias per se, I submit, is not the relevant test. The question is, was there a real risk of possibility of bias? And you say he removed that by the direction he gave at 3.22? And also by what he'd been telling them before. It's the whole thing has to be looked at.
Um, and um, it, 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 it's often said in the cases that the judge is entitled to look at, um, the judge in making these sorts of decisions will bear in mind his uh, view of the jury, so far as he can tell, over the course of the hearing. And in my submission, he was entitled to take into account also what the, the forewoman had said to him. And I do submit, if one asks, and looking at everything, if one looks at A, the verdict, B, the letting off of Shane Williams, and C, the evidence, which I, I'll come to later, if I may, which is simply overwhelming, one asks, what unconscious bias, so to speak, added to all the evidence which was there anyway. How could it have done? And that is the point about the strength of the case. One can see where the evidence is equivocal and so forth. One might say, well, I can, that's rather harder to tell. But if it's two and two equals four, well, one, there is in my submission a basis for saying the risk of the possibility of bias is, 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 has been removed or is not likely to have affected the jury's verdict or won't have affected the jury's verdict. <clears throat> um, can I just take you to the Bonnet and Taylor case? Because it is important at this point to what extent can you trust the jury quite properly and in accordance with their oath? And uh, we looked at one passage already. It's at 6291. Paragraph, I think I'm right in saying, uh, no, well, 6290, one can begin at, paragraph 24. Um, there was, however, another course that the judge could have taken, and did take in this case, that's, uh, let's say, um, not making further inquiries about uh, the juror. Um, at the outset of his summing up, he gave the usual direction to the jury, it was for them to decide what evidence to accept and what to reject. He then gave this direction. Decide this case on the evidence and only on the evidence. Do not be influenced by anything you might have been told by anyone, whether by some fellow member of the jury that sat or are sitting with you about some prior knowledge or feeling or view. That is unimportant. And if you act upon that, justice will have miscarried because that's not the evidence. I hope that I'm making myself absolutely clear that it's the evidence and only the evidence in this case that you have heard that you're entitled to act upon and determine. Having looked at the evidence, examined it, weighed it, determined what facts are, uh, the facts are, and ultimately what your verdict is after applying the law, and I will give you uh, to the facts that you find proved. Now, I agree that's a stronger warning, but nonetheless, nonetheless, it's to the same effect. Then, the important passage in paragraph 25, the assumption must be that the jury understood and followed the direction that they were given. See, a judgment of my own, as it were. In the Supreme Court of Canada, in Corbett, uh, Chief Justice Dixon said that the experience of trial judges is that juries perform their duty according to the law. According to law. In the High Court of Australia, in Denham, uh, Mason CJ and Tuhi J said that the law proceeds on the footing that the jury, acting in accordance with the instructions given to them by the trial judge, will render a true verdict in accordance with the evidence. To conclude otherwise would be to underrate the integrity of the system of trial by jury and the effect on the jury of the instructions by the trial judge. In the Irish High Court case of Z, um, Hamilton P expressed confidence in juries to follow the directions given to them by the trial judge. The direction which the uh, judge gave in this case was clear, understandable to the point. Board is satisfied that it was sufficient to deal with any risk that the juror who was excused might have said something that the jury ought not to have been told. Now, of course, my lord, everything turns, in one sense, on the facts of a particular case. But I do submit it as a fundamental principle that you trust the jury to act in accordance with their oath. And it is implicit, both in the judge's decision to leave this matter to the jury and in the Court of Appeals' decision, that they were satisfied with their knowledge, if I can put it this way, of how juries work, that they would have done. And, and does it matter that, I mean, inevitably you're focusing on the 10 because he didn't trust number the 11th. He had the police ready. He said he had the police ready. I accept that. That goes back to my answer to the first 
Well, I, I accept he but probably does it matter doesn't. matter for these purposes that it's it's a ju effectively he's trusting a jury of ten, yes. and ten's not a jury within the Jury Act in well, Jamaica, is it? it one then gets into what I call a rather metaphysical argument about what is a jury. <laughs> um, clearly, it's 11 people who walk into court. <laughs> um, what it, about that, I go back to my, the, what I call the first question. Is it really the case that there is no jury if it turns out afterwards that one of them had taken a bribe and was going to acquit come what may? That's if, if it turns out afterwards. Yes. What if you know going in? If you know going in, I submit the same follows. The, same. the judge is entitled to say this. A 10-1 ver verdict is a good verdict. It's authorised by law. I have good reason. I'm just, as it were, uh, expressing in words what no doubt the judge would be thinking. I have, very, I have good reason to trust the 10. They will follow my uh, directions. That is good enough to satisfy the requirements of the statute that there be a jury who decides this. Because there, there are 11 altogether, and uh, if there are 11 altogether and one of them still takes no notice of what I say, well, so be it. But my, my, I mean, my Lord Baldry put the point at the beginning, it's quite a short point, but quite an important point. But I do submit one, it, it, the, the crossover between these two questions it does arise, but I suppose it's very important to keep them separate. Because if, if, if I'm right in saying that a, a verdict by 11 men, or 11 men and women, one of whom is bent, is a good verdict at the time, then it's a good verdict. If, on the other hand, it's clear that there's a real risk that the 10 might have been influenced by the one, then I accept that might be a basis for setting aside the verdict. Just, just starting with the one, um, you say that the, the judge can choose to leave somebody on the jury, notwithstanding that he knows this person is corrupt. Presumably it's the same if he knows that the juror is mentally ill or communicating with the deceased via a Ouija board or has been looking up the internet. Um, it's, it's, it's the same, is it? No. Um, <laughs> no, my lords, it wouldn't be the same, if I may. No. Yeah. The important point here is the prosecution knows the problem, and in the passage I took you to, the prosecution says, we're the ones taking the risk. Well, but they can't waive the, uh, the public interest in the administration of justice. It's not a, well, a matter of... Well, the difficulty... My lords, if this had happened on day one, <laughs> It'll be a very different position, obviously. Well, you're really just postponing the question. 